The keyboard scene has well and truly exploded since I became a part of it. And what once was a gate-kept internet ecosystem that never had parts ready and available in stock, now has some great budget kits, customs that well and truly match up to their more high-end counterparts in quality, sound and feel, and a large number of sources to get up to date on how exactly you can go about building your own custom mechanical keyboard. But this comes with its own problems as well, right? Geez, this community really can't win. And that is in the fact that the information is so dense and varied that getting into the hobby now has a new layer of complexities. Like how do you navigate the best budget custom releasing three times over a number of months? Are MX Browns good again? Was he ever actually bad? Spoiler, they definitely weren't. Ticklish, at best. One of these complexities is sound and the best modifications that you can do to bring your new Keychron Q1 up to new levels of thong. So to save yourself a whole load of time reading online, foam isn't necessarily the answer. But more importantly than that, I've comprised a list of a number of things that you can do to alter the sound of your new custom and things to consider when you're trying to give your new build that specific sound signature that you're searching for. So let's just rip the bandaid off, eh? The first one is modifications. Who could have seen that coming? This one, no surprise to anyone, is the most effective way to improve the sound of your keyboard. When I say modifications, many things may come to mind. Tape or foam or both in the case of the keyboard is a big one for deepening the sound signature and reducing the resonance that could otherwise be heard throughout the build. It's important with both of these to take into account how exactly you'd like to alter the sound signature. If you want a keyboard that's deep and thocky, then go for it and fill that baby to the brim and tape up that PCB with a healthy three layers. But it's also worth noting that with a single layer of tape and a little bit of foam, you can still really bring out the richer sounds of a more hollow board while maintaining the characteristics of the specific switch that you've picked. Especially because I guarantee this switch is one that you've picked after spending weeks searching through sound tests on YouTube. When foam first came to light as something that drastically changed the sound signature of a build, specifically PE foam, people were obsessed with that marbly sound signature. This is something that a lot of people still really like. I'm one of them. Have a listen to this. but it's also worth noting that more doesn't necessarily mean better. At this point, I've built out my spring a number of times to find the configuration that I'm happiest with. If you want the PE foam sound, then it's worth trying out builds with all combination of PE, plate, and case foam to decide which one you like the best. On the same lines to bring out a more full sound, weights are a great one for this. Big hefty weights on keyboards may look cool, but they also do play a large part in the sound signature of the board. Some of these lighter, cheaper boards can benefit from the addition of weights, Quite a popular option for this is tire weights that you can pick up off of Amazon. They aren't too expensive, will add some good heft, and because of the sizings, they can fit a number of cases in any combination that you want. I know the people have custom cut weights for their tofu cases back in the day, and it's interesting to see that the weight add-ons for newer budget options, such as the Zoom 75. Silicon is another option for this, with some boards coming with silicon inserts in addition to or to replace the weight modules in the bottom of the case. Or you can just fill your keyboard with pennies. I know that was a thing at one point as well. One of my favorite things about these cheaper boards is categorically how well known they are for taking a multitude of different modifications. Now, this isn't so prevalent when some of the budget options already come with premium mounting methods, but for budget tray mounted case designs, being able to cut off the legs to make the board gummy o-ring is a game changer. The Mero 60 PCB was even designed to bypass the tray mount posts and to allow for o-ring mounting designed with boards like the Fiel and the Tofu in mind. I did this a while back as well as poured some concrete into a poker style case. I still don't know why I chose concrete. And the board paired with a PC plate and some long pulse switches sounded pretty damn good, I gotta say. Now, talking about some interesting materials, this brings me on to the second thing that I think you should take into account when trying to improve the sound of your keyboard. And this is taking into account the materials of everything in your build. I know what you're thinking, but this will be interesting, I promise. <laughs> when striving for that certain sound signature, it's important to take into account all parts of the keyboard build that you're working with, as well as how well they pair with each other. For example, pairing a thocky switch with a deeper plate like polycarbonate will probably be a good place to start to achieve that sound signature that you're striving for. If we take this concept that one step further, you can really break down the materials in combination with the mounting style to get the sound signature that you want. For example, I find very flexy boards such as those where the PCB is full of flex cuts or o-ring mounted to have sound signatures that are far quieter than their stiffer counterparts. 
if you aren't using foams that is. For this reason, long pulse switches can be great here to bring to light a nicer sound signature that would otherwise be very loud in a build like top mount or a traditional gasket mount that is little to no flex and so will have a harsher bottom out. On the same line, long pole switches sound great in plateless builds to really get the full sound out of that long pole and with boards like the QK75 bringing plateless configurations to a wider number of people, this is definitely one to try if you haven't already. I for one quite like the combination of long pole switches with softer plate materials but on stiffer boards to really get that nice middle ground. I think that the Zaku switches sound great on polypropylene but if this build had been with an alu plate instead it would definitely get me kicked out of the office. On the flip side, very unstated switches in terms of loudness, but those that still have a really nice sound like MX Blacks, Gat Yellows, or any of the JWK switches that have released over the years sound great on aluminium full or half plate configurations to really get that full sound signature coming through without being overbearing with that long pole stem. And this brings me to the last stop on our journey, switch modifications themselves. First thing everyone will tell you about when you first get into keyboards is lubing your switches. This is to remove the scratchiness and noise from contacts as the switch moves from resting position to bottom out and back to resting position again. This is arguably one of the most important aspects as a switch with leaf or spring pin can really make or break a build. In this day and age, a lot of switches come pre-lubed from factory and it's a lot more consistent than it was a few years back. So if you don't fancy lubing switches yourselves, this is a great option. But saying this, it's worth doing research to see if the specific switch you are after has a good factory lube job or not. I've heard good things about the Akko line of switches, but I'm yet to try any of these myself, so I can't say for certain. Another route, if you're willing to splash the cash, is to buy switches that have already been lubed by someone else. This can either be from companies that offer this as a service, or buying them secondhand off of somewhere like Mech Market. Although this does cost considerably more, so it's worth weighing up what is more important to you, and ultimately, if you want to spend X amount of hours lubing switches or not. I know that the first set I lubed myself was terrible and after lubing so many sets now i'd rather just pay for someone to lube them instead of me doing it myself but if you haven't done this before some people say it's really relaxing and it's something that you can do while sticking on a show listening to a podcast and there are so many good tutorials out there now on how to do this i'll link a few of them in the description and if you thought lubing switches couldn't be any more mind numbing why don't you try filming all jokes aside, filming switches is something that a few years back, if you told me to do it, I'd have told you that you're an idiot taking a big, big huff of that copium, justifying the minute differences in sound. But honestly, for some of these switches, which if they didn't have some pretty poor tolerances, they'd be perfect. If you're taking them apart to lube them, why not just stick a film in at the same time, eh? <laughs> The difference in sound isn't going to make or break a build, but it's definitely something that, when it spans across a whole board, is noticeable. And the final one on the list is spring swapping. This is something that I've gone into a little more in depth in a previous video, so I'll link that for you if you want to look at it after. But different length springs, dual staged, progressive springs will all give you slightly different sound signatures, which can aid to produce better sounds out of your build. This is especially true if you want to extenuate a characteristic of the switch, like a snappier top out for your cherry switches, or a lighter spring so that you can hammer down on that bottom out for a far easier press. When it really comes down to it, none of this stuff actually matters, right? It's all subjective, and if you like the way your keyboard looks, sounds, and feels, then that's all that matters, right? But if you are looking to get a little deeper into this hobby, then I hope you found this a good place to start. So that's it. Those are my three ways to make your cheap keyboard sound more premium. Anything that would be on your list that's not on mine, let me know in the comments. Make sure to subscribe if you aren't already and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Socials are all down below. Thanks for watching and I will see you nerds in the next one. Peace.